group was on March 20th and April 25th. <coughs> Thing that we have been doing is 
calling uh, the unsubmitted candidates. So what unsubmitted candidates are, are people who started the application but didn't click that little itty bitty submit button at the bottom. With our software system that we use for tracking applicants, when you are using a mobile browser, such as your cell, you may be using your cell phone, you may be using an iPad or a pencil to apply, you get to the end of that application, you click I agree to all of these terms, and a lot of times, excuse me, people think that they have completed the application, but they haven't, because there's a small submit icon in that bottom right corner. So one of the things that we have started doing is contacting those candidates to make sure that they actually click that button, so we are not eliminating people up front uh, in, from the process. The next item on the list talks about staffing agencies for sub-staffing. There was new legislation passed that was enacted earlier this year that allowed school districts to work with, to partner with staffing agencies for potentially um, filling their substitute teaching positions. So we've met with four of those um, agencies to try to develop a plan to do so. Um, we have also increased the sub-pay rates throughout the district. We did some research on market data and we had increased those pretty early on in the school year for a variety of our sub-pay districts. So that has also helped to support attracting some more talent. We also started searching this year the Illinois Department of Employment Security website. IDES requires anyone who is drawing on employment benefits to create a profile on the site inclusive of their work history or a resume. And that allows employers who are registered to go out there and search through those resumes for specific skills. So perhaps I could search for Sam Levine some paraprofessional positions, I could search for paraprofessional or I could search for aid. Or if I were looking to fill some bus driver positions, I could search for driver or bus to, to develop a wide list of potential candidates. And we were called from those uh, potential candidates. So um, one of the other things that we have been doing is we've made an effort to look at job postings from the candidate perspective by making them more human and including sections from what the job looks like on a given day to how they may fit. So further looking at things from the candidate perspective, we've also been working to streamline the application. Um, other organizations may be completed in a matter of a few clicks with a resume upload, but that's not how our system is set up. So if um, a person has a choice between completing a 30 minute application like ours, or just uploading a resume in a few clicks, and all other factors are comparable, they're probably going to apply to this one first before ours. So what we have worked to do is work within our system limitations and streamline that resume, uh, streamline that application itself to try to limit the fields to what is just required in that application process. So we've talked about um, recruitment, so let's move on to the landscape of some of our applicants. Um, last year, we showed a random sampling of a number of candidates who begun the application process. So this chart also does very similar to what we did last year, shows various number of candidates for positions that we posted throughout the year. Naturally, the number of applicants is going to vary per job posting that you have up there, as well as per the time of year. Um, you may not have a large market of people who are wanting to be a playground supervisor for two and a half hours a day. So naturally, you're going to see fewer applicants on something like that. Um, so if you look at some of these items on here, the highest on this chart is the administrative assistant at Glenwood High School with 74 people who started that application process. And then over here on the left, you will see an evening custodian at Lowell, uh, Lowell at Chatham Elementary that had 51 people who had begun that process. Um, you'll see six who had started who had started the application process for sixth grade language arts at GIS. And then another one just to look, look at for an example is the principal role at CES that had 20. So this is just a random sampling of some of our jobs throughout the year. It's not specific to recent job postings or even job postings that we had posted at the beginning of the school year, but we just pulled a few <laughs> random ones throughout the school year. <coughs> this pie chart um, shows our attrition data for all roles in the district. So that includes certified, non-certified, um, administrator, uh, union, non-union. So as you see on this chart in the purple section, that biggest section is on retirement. 29% of our retirement for the 18-19 school year is due to retirement. Um, the next category that is closest is a tie between relocation in that green color bottom left and family obligations, very similar color, top right corner. 
Um, closely following that are health reasons at 90%. We said believe that that's the next color we will see on there. So there are other factors on here that are smaller percentages as you see, but we tried to break it down a little bit more clearly so we were giving a um, clear view of what, what we were seeing on here. Some of these on here, for example, you will see someone going to another line of work, that's 2%. So they're totally leaving education, they're going to do something in, uh, in a total other field. Some people, 2% um, were looking at for jobs closer to home, or 3% were needing fewer hours. So again, this is for all goals in the industry, not just certified staff or ESP staff. Uh, but while we are on this slide, I do want to note that the Illinois School Report Card tracks teacher retention data from year to year. And the most recent publication on teacher-specific retention data is for 17, 18, 18, 19 data is not out yet. So for 17, 18, um, Paul Shadam had retention rate was 87.6%, and the state uh, is 85.2%. So we are doing better than the state. Uh, we did also pull a sampling, which is not included in this slide, of local districts as well as LUDA districts. So LUDA districts are large unit districts, and we pulled those with comparable enrollments to ours. Those were four to 6,000 students. And in that trend data over a five-year period, Paul Shadham was the only district from local districts as well as those comparable LUDA districts that has increased their retention rates year over year. Some of those other districts had increased their retention rates between one year and the next, but not consistently. So we are definitely making progress in this area, although naturally there is more room to do. So um, when you look at attrition data, you do want to break it down further. Uh, the focus for an organization should be on what's called controllable attrition. Every organization is going to have attrition of some sort. So the, the idea to get rid of attrition altogether is impossible. That's, that's never going to happen or be attainable. So we do want to look at attrition that is attributable to the employer and attrition that is not attributable to the employer. So if you remember from that last slide, 29% of our attrition this year was from retirement. 12% um, due to relocation, 12% due to family obligations, and 9% due to health reasons. So obviously those are our biggest factors on there, and those numbers add up pretty quickly. So we had a total of 79% for the 18-19 school year of attrition that was not attributable to the employer. So there is 21% of attrition that is attributable to the employer. So that may include factors like uh, people are needing more hours or fewer hours. They, uh, those would be factors that we would want to look at to say, is this another role we could move them into? For example, somebody needs two and a half hours. One of the things that we have done is work with transportation for a playground supervisor and say, well, they're in the middle of the day. Could you use them as a bus monitor in the morning and afternoon? So some of those are things that we can look at, and some of those are things that we can look at controlling. Um, so we have started implementing the exit survey this year. Um, organizations tend to get more data when there's a degree of anonymity to that, because oftentimes people don't want to meet with you face to face to give you that feedback um, when they're on their way out. But we are able to set up appointments with employees that are able to set those exit interviews up if they would like to have an exit interview. And as we're getting that exit survey data back, we have been setting um, exit interviews up with people if they give some, some, some responses to the questions that we may have concerns about or we can use to dig in further. So uh, this following slide is on training and learning and development, and that's a key HR functional area that supports some of our organizational development objectives. So this past year, we added some voluntary summer HR training sessions. One was the Jack Canfield Success Principles, and the other was the Family and Medical Leave Act training. While we had the GCM platform training for a couple of years, this year we sought to ensure that all employees were taking the correct courses for their roles. So we did spend some time looking at the mandatory trainings for the school district um, for employees to see if there was anything else that may be relevant to their role in the district. This year we did implement another training option, which was the Skillsoft training. Skillsoft is a pretty well-known training program. Um, they are very different than GCN. GCN is our mandatory compliance training. So Skillsoft trainings could be things like IT training for people, for job to, um, staff in, in that, that department, dealing with difficult people in the workplace, leadership training, and, and a variety of other things. So they, they do have a, quite a bit out there that employees can look at. There's thousands of courses. So this is beneficial because employees can voluntarily take something when they see a skills gap in themselves. 
Um, but administrators can also talk to employees if they see a problem arise and assign them the training. For example, if people are having conflict in the workplace, you can assign that to, to discuss um, conflict resolution. So there are courses on there for that. The last item on here is our sub onboarding program. Um, in the past, we allowed potential subs to come in, to drop off their license, to fill out some paperwork while we were here. But that didn't really give us a chance to spend any time with those subs and kind of get to know them. So this year we changed our process to have all of our subs come in for an orientation session, just like we do all of the rest of our employees. That gives them a more formal introduction to our district and allows us to spend a little bit of time with them. We also reviewed some of the GCN courses to assign to our prospective new subs, such as classroom management, safety, and ethics and boundaries. So this should better prepare them for what it's like to be in a classroom day in and day out. <laughs> HR communications. Um, this year the HR department has increased their visibility both internally and externally. Oftentimes when people think of the HR departments, they see us at certain times in their travels with us, but they're aware of what goes on behind the scenes, and there is a lot that goes on behind the scenes in the HR department. So we started the um, HR newsletter this year, and we sent out a couple editions of that. Contained within that HR newsletter is a live well, work well newsletter, which comes from our benefits brokers. Um, that contains things like tips on healthy eating, the importance of sunscreen in the summer, things on work-life balance and other topics like that. Another newsletter that we share is the ESP newsletter. This one is not sent electronically. This one's placed in the break room on the um, break room tables for employees in each building to review. Um, that contains information on items related to the employee assistance program, specifically like balanced living, setting financial goals, or maybe even curbing those who won't be there. Earlier this year, um, School CEO Magazine reached out to interview us for an article on recruiting millennial talent. An excerpt from that interview is featured in the May publication of the School CEO Magazine. Um, the HR communications calendar and that HR communications survey, those two really do go hand in hand for us. We've been working on an HR communications calendar in an attempt to be proactive in our communications on various <coughs> HR topics. Naturally, there are always going to be those issues that pop up that we need to address and send an email out right then. But the purpose of the HR communications calendar is to get information out on a schedule for topics that relate to our employees that they feel that they would like to know more about. So we did have a list of ideas from issues and challenges that we've seen, but we recently sent out that HR communication survey to find out what HR-related topics employees would be interested in, the frequency of those communications, as well as their preferred delivery method for those. So once we ultimately get those results, that will help us build out that HR communications calendar for that 1920 school year. Benefits. This is also a pretty well-known area within HR. Um, we have been with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield since 2013 for our health insurance. And we have seen some increases over that time. And um, in 16, 17 school year, it was 3% increase. So really modest increase. In 17, 18, it was an 11% increase. And then had we remained with Blue Cross this year, it would have been an 8.9% overall increase. So the insurance committee met with our broker, our benefit brokers who reviewed the potential plans we did go to the market to get some other options to see what um, what that may look like. And we did go with Health Alliance. Um, they allowed us to keep the same benefit plan design, but with a rate reduction, and that the rate reduction for the HMO plan was 5.95%. The rate reduction for the HSA plan was 14.89%, and the rate reduction for the PPO plan was 9.09%. So that was a significant savings um, by converting to Health Alliance. As you see in the chart on the left, if it, if it stays up there, um, 529 employees were benefits eligible, and of that 529, 453 completed the open enrollment process. Aside from health insurance, which we will talk about on the right in just a minute, um, the top benefit enrollment was dental, very closely followed by vision, and then voluntary life insurance. If you look at the chart on the right, it does break down the health insurance enrollment by um, benefit. So there were 241 employees enrolled in some type of PPO plan, whether it be employee, employee plus spouse, employee plus children, or employee plus family. There were 26 enrolled in some type of HSA plan, and 173 enrolled in some type of HMO plan. Beyond the benefits that employees enrolled in for open enrollment, we did have a wellness fair over the summer. We had about um, 20 vendors. This is included in that newsletter that we had shared on the right. And then this is a picture from that wellness fair. Um, about 60 employees attended, and then this was during the summer last year. We have had several employees say, we'd like, we would be interested in that if 
have gone over a lot of stuff that the HR department has done in the last year in a very short time frame. So I'll briefly touch on our focus areas for 1920. So our focus areas for the 1920 school year are communications, analytics, talent acquisition, and training. So within communications, we do look to send that HR newsletter out quarterly. This past year was then our first run with that. We also look to create that HR communications calendar with specific information that we're going to send out, and that data is going to be based on that HR communication survey results. For analytics, we are wanting to include that more frequently in the HR newsletters. There's data that exists that I think oftentimes people don't know or they don't know what to ask about. So we do look to include that more frequently to have that more forward facing. Uh, we also want to include any topics, any analytics topics that come out of that HR communication survey. For talent acquisition and recruitment, we do look to do more sourcing. Sourcing is looking for those candidates that are past as candidates, the people who are not applying to your jobs, but you are going out to actively get those and get those people into our talent pipeline and create communications with them before we have an opening. And then the last one <coughs> on there was training. Uh, so we're looking to expand our HR Summer Training Series offerings. We actually meet tomorrow morning to plan those out, to look for what the topics are going to be and the dates that those are going to be offered. And some of that's going to come from um, our HR communication survey as well as the EFT um, training survey that we did.
like the idea of um, I really like the idea of um, recognizing that it's um, employer control. I think that we've never done that before, and I do think um, within that um, within that subcategory of employer control, there are environmental.
shared in our newsletters. And uh, I think to uh, HR department's point, uh, this has been a focal point in our district. Uh, I, and again, the barometer that I use is when I arrive, looking at student teacher ratios of the classroom size. As we know that in our community, that's been an issue that we've been trying to address. So last year, we were able to hire uh, additional teachers for this year. And this year, we hired eight more teachers next year. So uh, over the past couple of years, we've hired in 14 or 15 uh, teachers. And uh, so we're going to begin to see that data. It's always kind of a, you know, a year in arrears, so you don't see the impact until the next year. But uh, we're certainly making progress towards that. We'll continue to do that. Uh, the board, even prior to the seating of our new board, has made a commitment to adding those teachers each year. So we're looking at next year, of course, we have to analyze our financial status, look at what our fund balances are, and as we continue on the trajectory uh, in regards to maximizing our resources and minimizing our expenditures and really keeping a tight cap on our finances, we're gonna look to add more teachers next year. So you can look forward to that as a community, but that has been a focal point and will continue not only good for our teachers in terms of their ability to work with students in lower numbers in the classroom, it's great for our students because they get more one-on-one -on -one time. So we're excited about that. We're going to continue to chart that progress and we'll present that in upcoming board meetings as well. Okay, moving on to uh, 4.2. Cleveland Clinic Banner School Recognition.
Anyone else like to see? Okay. Moving on to section five, consent agenda items. <coughs> Does anyone wish to share Okay, would anyone else like to wish to pull any items beyond five to nine? Okay, okay. Moving on to section six, consent agenda item number one, consent agenda item number one, consent agenda item Anyone forward and take me on the bike? Just say, I'm going to get it. Just shut up. You're all good? Okay, so I need a uh, motion to approve consent agenda items 5.1 and 5.8. Okay, so we have a motion to approve consent agenda items 5.1 and 5.8. Second. Specifically moving to 5.9. Can uh, uh, and, and on this? I understand what the uh, IASB membership is. Um, it's not exactly clear to me what the LUDA membership entails. And so, since we're going to spend 3500 bucks on it, I wanted to ask about it. And uh, I wanted to make sure I understood the benefits of having both of them. The LUDA membership is a large unit you know, association. So, these are all districts that, of course, an uh, acronym would insinuate of the larger districts. So we have workshops and training uh, that you know, we get to you know, the administrator to support staff. Uh, for example, my tech director is going to the training program that we said. Uh, and, you know, for the new districts, not just being a larger district, but being a 3 k <coughs> district, we experience a lot of different things than, uh, say, or even the high school district itself. So I've got an extremely valuable. I know when I attend, I know that we had uh, safety and security directors and HR who was meeting with all this technology. My assistant superintendent, uh, I even believe Chad, did you know? Did you know you attended? Did you directly? Did you attend a little bit? Oh, yeah, no, you haven't. I know that Jim and Transportation have. So it really offers a lot of professional opportunities for all of our directors. And am I correct in assuming that we have to be members to attend those yes. meetings? Yes. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Moving on to 
Okay. Uh, any further discussion on five nine? Need a motion to approve five nine? Yes. 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 Okay, you're hearing none. I need a motion to approve 6.1 through 6.35. So It isn't just our park data. It isn't just our map data. 
it is some of the anecdotal data that our teachers take on a daily basis to work with students. We have conversations throughout the year to really review where are we at, where do we want to go, and how are we going to get there. We have really practiced responsive teaching and responsive leadership. That has been a major goal of ours. So these conversations have continued to occur, and we get to the point where it's now what? What's the next thing we can do? We, we have multiple layers of support, but it isn't enough because that's not who we are. We're not going to settle. We're not going to be satisfied with where we're at. It's that continuous growth model. So in 2017, our Board of Education set a strategic plan. The number one goal was student success. They deemed that that was the number one priority for this district was student success. So for us, as leaders and as team members, we knew that was our focus. That was our mission. It had always been there, but for finally the board committed to it. They went forward and said, this is it. You, you have to make it happen. Our kids are coming in with needs that are changing. They have diverse learning styles. They have more needs than we've ever seen. And we have more kids than ever, which is great because ball chatting is awesome so people keep coming, which is what we want. But we need to continually grow to keep up with our kids and how they learn. So to do that, we have to kind of figure out what, what do we need to do different. We can't keep doing what we've always done because our kids are changing. Their needs are changing. We need to continually grow so that they can continue to grow. So throughout these conversations after the strategic plan, our instructional leadership team, here's another layer, you're going to hear me say lots of layers tonight, and I apologize for the names and acronyms that we say, but our instructional leadership team, which is pri pri primarily our principals, I'm on that team, our director of technology, our director of special education, we bring in our instructional coaches, we sit at the table and we talk about the overall needs of our district because it's important that we have a district view as well as an individual building view. So in November of 2017, we created for the first time in this district a continuous improvement. <coughs> and at our November meeting, our special meeting for curriculum and instruction, we presented that for approval for a Board of Education. It was a long meeting. It's probably the longest ever of the curriculum and instruction special board meeting, but it was worth it because that should be our longest meeting that we ever had because that's why we're here and our kids deserve that. So we went through a series of goals that we set in order to meet the board's number one goal of student success. We set five goals. And then as a district, we set 12 actions. We committed to 12 actions that we were going to do over a five-year period in order to meet those five goals. Because we all know it's great to set goals, but if you don't have an action plan of how you're going to get there, it's just a goal on paper. That was not what we wanted when we created this plan. We wanted a sustainable plan that was going to be implemented and followed through. That's what our kids deserve. So one of the um, actions that came forth out of that plan, which was guided from input from our current teachers, was leveraging time. That was our number two action. The action was analyze, explore, and adjust the usage of time in the district, buildings, and classrooms to maximize achievement including but not limited to start and end times, building schedule, late start, early release, block scheduling, win, PTH, collaboration, and professional development, et cetera. As a district in November 2017, our school board at that time approved this plan as one of our actions that we needed to commit to and make happen within a five-year period. At our meeting in November of 2018, when we presented again and we went through all of our data and we went through our individual school improvement plans, as well as how we reflected on our district plan. At that time, I came to you again and said, it's time to act on this commitment. It is time to start having the discussion. We knew it was going to be a tough one. We knew it was going to impact our families. We knew that it would involve change. And any time there's change, it's hard. But we knew that our children deserve the conversation. And so we had a choice at that time. Do we shy away and wait again, wait another year? or is it time that we commit to it? Thankfully, we were in negotiations this year. Some people may say it was a rough year. I say it was great, because we learned a lot from our teachers about what our kids need. We learned a lot from our staff of what they need. We heard that. They said they need time. So this recommendation is a joint effort from both the DCA and the administration. After negotiations ended, we formed a leveraging time committee. Yet again, another layer of involvement. Again, we have our calendar committee, which involves a certain set of people. 
our instructional leadership team, our board of education. Now we added another layer, our leveraging time committee. I want to thank those people because several of them are here tonight because they committed to, we had four meetings in a quick time frame, but we had a lot of conversation virtually because that's, you use technology to your advantage. So we were able to accomplish a lot that way. Joanne Bose represented Ball Elementary. <coughs> Terry Pack as the president of the BCBA. Erin Kern represented Chatham Elementary. Sarah Flott represented Glenwood Elementary. Mike Cohen, Glenwood Intermediate School. Ashley Welch, Glenwood Middle School. Amanda Johnson, Glenwood High School. Dr. Wood, Betsy Schroeder as our director of communications. Church of Burke and Elizabeth Gregorich represented our principal team. And then we pulled in some parents from our community because the point of this team was making sure that we looked at all angles. We tried to explore as many options as we could so that we found the option that was best for our kids. So I'd like to thank Dave Kimsey, our mayor, who's kind of hiding in the back. <laughs> and actually we participated and brought great knowledge for our team, Kenia Sarah, Kelly Sutherland, and Don Holmes. Again, we tried to pick some parents that represented different age groups, had some different needs. Dawn shared already about her size and special needs. We knew that was going to be a concern. We wanted to make sure they were at the table. So we tried to find representation that could really come to the table and really get the issue to make sure that we looked at it from all angles. When we started our first meeting, I, I gave them a quick action plan and I said I have an aggressive timeline because I knew that parents needed time <coughs> in order to make arrangements. We knew this was going to be a potential inconvenience for any change that we had. So we wanted to move quickly because we wanted to give parents that time. We knew that if we waited until June or July, that was not enough time for implementation in office. So we really talked about what was needed. What could we do to improve student learning? We did not talk about what was best for our teachers. We did not talk about what was best for adults. We focused on what was best for student learning. Those conversations were really, really amazing. And you can kind of see the posters that are hung up in my office. But overall, the team decided the focus was to create a sustainable culture of growth for our staff and students. That is our goal. In order to improve student learning, we needed to provide, we looked at research, John Hattie, we looked at a lot of it. And that was in the communication that we sent to families. I'm going to touch on that a little bit because I do want to address some of that. But we did look at research, and we looked at what um, what different strategies or practices have the highest effect on student learning. The number one, after a 1,200 meta-analysis, is teacher efficacy. Teacher efficacy is, is teachers believing they can do it, that they feel confident, that they know that they have the tools in order to do it. They have a shared belief in action. That is the number one impact, positive impact on student achievement. In addition, we learned that consistent peer-to-peer -peer learning was important. But sit and get once a month in three-hour segments wasn't sustainable. It didn't keep the conversation going. It's that ongoing conversation with the teacher down the hall. Because we have amazing teachers in this district that have a lot to share, and we need to utilize them. We really need to tap into them. We also had a conversation about professional learning versus professional development. Professional development is that training. Now, we are required, as Ashley shared, that there are certain trainings that school code means that we do. In fact, there are 10 that we are required to do every other year. There are six that we are required to do annually. There is one that we are required to do just one time upon hire, and there is another one that we are required to do every five years. So while ISBE sets for mandated trainings that we have to do, I consider that more professional development. That's a training where we focus on professional learning, which is true collaboration. True collaboration does not mean prep time for teachers. I want to make that very clear, but it's absolutely what it is not. Collaboration is looking at data. And, and just as some of our teachers shared, it really is analyzing the strengths and weaknesses that our students are seeing, really coming, looking at your instructional practice and adjusting that practice based on the data that you have. Remember I talked about responsive teaching? That's the essence of what collaboration is. Within that, we have ongoing conversations about what best practice is. We look at teacher leadership. We look at communication. We look at a systems approach. Even though we have three elementaries that have different needs, we want to very much align as much as possible because we want every student in this district, one of our goals, 
is that they have the same opportunity experience regardless of which classroom they're in. They should have the same exposure and opportunity as the one in the classroom beside them. To make that happen, we needed to find time. So we, we decided that that was important. Our kids deserve that. In order to see growth, you task us every year. We want you to get better. Here's more you have to do. We expect more. We need the resources and the tools and the time to be able to make that happen. Isaac alluded earlier about quantity versus quality. This is about quality. And he did make a great point about it's unknown whether it's going to be successful. So what we're saying to you is that every November when we have that very most important, everybody mark it down, because I should have a big audience like this in November. At that meeting, we're going to review how that change in the schedule impacted student learning. Because we should start to see a correlation in our student success. We should be able to look at our multiple data sources. There should be accountability tied to this. There should be follow through. There should be reflection. It will happen every November. We will review that and we will present where we are. And just as much as I'm, we task our teachers to be responsive teaching, we will be responsive leaders. And if this isn't working, we aren't, we're going to go back to the drawing board and figure out what now can we do differently to improve student learning because that's why we're here is that continuous culture of growth. When our committee met, we met four times in person. Again, we had lots of conversations virtually. We surveyed all of our staff April 18th. Actually, how many employees we have? Over 600? Mm -hmm. Over 600 people received our survey because we went to them and we said, what potential obstacles or challenges could a change like this present our kids and our families? because our team wanted to listen to everything and make sure that we could problem solve as many as we could. We received 72 responses to our survey. So not a great response rate, but it did say the number one theme that came through was your concern with childcare. That was brought to us from our staff, the concern of the financial impact, as well as the scheduling, the potential schedule impact to families. We reviewed that as a team. We talked through several things. We talked about the different ways that you could find child support. We talked about our athlete, Dusty Burke, I think was going to strangle me at one point because I kept asking for more data. I wanted to know by season the number of athletes we had involved. I wanted to know the grades of them to see how many of them drive because I wanted to make sure that if we went to an early release model, that our students who needed to be there in one hour for a practice did not have to go home and we inconvenienced our parents again to drive them back. We wanted to see if we had staff available to supervise them and then also provide them with an academic study table. So that allows them to get a head start on their homework before they go to practice. So maybe they don't have as much homework after practice when they're worn out and tired and tired. So Dusty gave me a lot of information. We looked at teacher attendance data as we walked through different options to see if there were different days of the week where our teachers were, were accessed more than others because we wanted to make a decision in which our teachers were going to be there because we wanted all of our teachers there. We did not want our coaches gone at, at practice. We wanted our teachers to be there because they were teachers first. We looked at that data. We then looked at student data because we wanted to see was there a different day of the week where maybe students miss a lot to see maybe that could be the day that we make a change in there. Was there a day of the week where our sports teams are leaving or have contact and have to leave school early? We looked at that. Our student attendance data didn't really, there was no clear cut. It was pretty consistent with the council. One of the other options we looked at was we thought about our students who attend CACC, FCLA, Safe Schools, Sex Ed, Hope. We have several students who are Glenwood students who are serviced by outside entities. So we wanted to make sure that they weren't impacted by that and services they received. CACC, actually Dr. Wood had a conversation on our behalf. It actually worked out for the better because we found out that really, our students have been going in the afternoon. They really wanted our students in the morning. Well, that was, that was a great thing. So there are three programs that they can only offer in the afternoon, and we have seven students that will be impacted by that that we were unable to move in the morning. We had a long conversation with transportation. A really meeting of the mind because we wanted to make sure that 
Transportation could make this happen because there's a, there are a lot of moving pieces when you make a major decision or recommendation like this. Mr. Lovelace, we talked to a lot of different options. We really talked about pre-K because the timing of our pre-K program really could impact transportation. Trisha provided us some options for pre-K because we knew we had to adjust those hours as well. Really the, the option that Trisha preferred lined up with what transportation wanted. It was again, it was like, it's a warning. That was great. That was another conversation we had. Bessie did a lot of work on the back end calling people. We did have several conversations with all of our daycares about this, of telling them when it was coming. We told them before we were sending a communication out to families because we knew that the, our families, when they received this communication, were gonna go to their daycare provider. So we wanted to make sure that they were prepared and they knew that that's what we were looking at going forward. Once we looked through all of the obstacles, we put together that frequently asked question sheet because there seemed to be a theme of what everybody was asking because we wanted to communicate and be transparent with our families. We wanted you to see every option that we considered and kind of how we problem solve the market. Child care, you're right, was the number one thing we could increase, the financial impact of child care. We went through that those questions and we decided that we were gonna send an email out to all of our parents. We sent out an email to over 5,000 people we sent that email to. We even checked the analytics the next day to see how many people received it because we wanted to make sure that we were communicating with our families. So it, 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 it hurts to hear that you didn't receive it. We don't know what that issue is, as if we have the wrong email address, but we did attempt to contact 5,000 parents. Josh went in on the back end to pull how many. And while we sent out over 5,000, we think about 4,000 actually landed to the people we did. So knowing that we had, so then we looked at the number of students we have and how many families have multiple students in the district to try to see if we hit as many, every family. So we try to whittle it down because while we have 4,800 4, students, we don't have 4,800 4, families. And Josh was, we really didn't lose. I mean, we spent a lot of time on some different aspects of this, but the numbers we came at, when we arrived at over 4,000 emails that we received, we felt pretty confident that it did go to all of our families. We also, when we timed that communication to be sent to our families, we went to our major people in our community of, who have kind of run the Facebook page. We asked them to post the exact communication that we sent to families onto their social media platform because we were looking for as many different ways that we could get this information out to our families and get input from them. We received 47 emails in response to the communication that we sent on Facebook. <laughs> Of those 47 emails that we received, 29 noted, please no, don't vote for that. And that can be broken up into this one. Um, four were concerned about the loss of instructional time. That's one concern. 12 were concerned about the inconvenience to their family schedule. And 12 were concerned about the financial impact of child care. My number is not to keep on 29 right there. Um, so it's 20. So yes, we have to go back to this. Um, but um, this week we did receive an additional five emails once the board agenda was posted. All five were against this because of the issue of child care. So in total we received 52 emails that were sent to us. Of those 52, we did receive 10 that were very positive and said we support this change. Please do this. Sit days are very difficult for our families to staff. For them, they, they mentioned that it was hard to get child care for the four hours of the day versus one hour every Wednesday. They also wanted it to align with 186. We did have questions about why are you keeping four sick days if you're doing this because there is a loss of 22 instructional hours. We need sick days because we need more than an hour. As I talked about the mandated trainings, there are other trainings, crisis prevention too, is a three hour refresher that is required every other year. There are also, when you take that initial training, it is a seven hour training. We cannot get all of our required trainings that take longer than an hour on the four institute days that we have. We looked at that. Could we do it? Could we reduce the SIP days? Our team felt, and we talked about this as a whole with our parents that were very transparent, <coughs> felt that the quality of the instruction and the rigor of the instruction that our kids are gonna going to gain from this and the impact it's going to have on student achievement was worth keeping the four school improvement days. That we still needed that time. 
So we knew going in, it was not going to be a swap of an even trade in time. We knew there was going to be a loss of instructional time. We feel that the benefit to student learning will outweigh that those 22 hours. <coughs> we are committing to accountability for that. It will be guided and prescribed. Our principals are going to training this summer of how best to utilize that time and have the most effective system. And we will report out annually on the impact on students and just to make changes if necessary. All I did want to mention, I talked about it earlier because I had some suggestions made to me about split or separating the time oh, across the five days, and you had mentioned to me why that was not an option. Yes, thank you for reminding me. I didn't see that in my notes. So, um, one of the options was could you just take it and divide it up evenly across? We did explore that option. Um, unfortunately, when you move to an option like that, so that would require our teachers staying an hour after school on a day, that would only afford us 20 minutes of overlap between our buildings that have staggered times. The model that we selected gains us a minimum of 40 minutes each week for our teachers to be able to work together across buildings. That affords us vertical conversations that also allows some consistency conversations between our three elementary. We did also look at a late start versus early release because I did get two emails from high school students. <laughs> Not only, but it was in my I don't know that it was you, but I did get two students asking me to keep a late start because they like the extra time on Monday. Coming off the weekend, it's hard to get back in the group. Um, so we did discuss that, but our daycares for all of our families that were already there could not accommodate that the um, late start. They could accommodate the early release. So we quickly moved to the early release model at that point when the daycare said there was no way they could accommodate that at all for me. Did I answer that question? Well, well I personally am thrilled about the uh, reduction in the number of set days. I have four kids. I've talked to them uh, in the past. I come home early from the half day. Well, what did you do today? And I, it, it just seems to me that that the instructional time they get in the morning is very limited. Um, so <coughs> I think it's a, a positive uh, going forward to um, eliminate four of the, the set days. Um, I, uh, I am a little concerned about the uh, reducing the in-class instructional time because it's not it's a net negative from that and that's every Wednesday. And frankly, as I had told you, uh, I, I didn't realize it was going to be uh, every Wednesday until this week when I looked at the calendar because that was the first time I seen the calendar. Um, it, I you know I personally would like I think maybe there's some Wednesdays that we could potentially eliminate the early dismissal on, but I'm not proposing that because it may be very practical to, impractical to implement. Uh, so, I, I mean, I uh, I uh, appreciate the excitement that you've shown and, and the committee show, has shown about it, uh, and I think it's uh, a net positive policy going forward. I am quite concerned about the collateral effects on uh, families who are working and, and uh, uh, haven't nailed down access to child care. I, can, I, I mean, I didn't learn until this week again about the cost uh, of child care. That, that gives me uh, some serious pause. Um, I think uh, someone, whether it's the board or the administration, needs to work harder to um, identify options that are, are more like what uh, the options available at 186, if, if that's if that's accurate, to $7, $7.50 a, a day. Uh, and I think they also may have uh, the option of uh, requesting a waiver for low-income folks. Uh, I, so I am concerned about the collateral effects. And, you know, in weighing the, uh, the, uh, the policy versus those effects, though, I don't know that uh, collateral effects should stop the implementation of a good policy, though. Uh, one final thing I one final thing I like to say is that you know I, I'm a new board member. I'm reading a lot of stuff, getting up to speed. Okay, and we, we have some uh, information we've been provided. One of the uh, enumerated uh, jobs of the school board is to adopt the school calendar. So 
I don't quite understand the committee structure yet. I don't think the committee that set this up was a board committee. I don't think the calendar committee is a, is a board committee. But I personally think that uh, a, uh, at least one board member ought to be participating in these committees going forward, and I would volunteer to, to at least participate in the calendar committee going forward because I do think we need to uh, monitor the effectiveness if we, if we uh, vote in favor of this policy. Thanks for a very good presentation. And in fact, I had sat on the calendar yeah. so I mean, you, you all can work that out, but that was at one time going to going what we did. Well, I um, would like to say something. Um, I've been on the board six years. I've been through the PCEA negotiations. This is the third And Jen is exactly right that um, it's very hard to brainstorm and collaborate in 20 minutes. Um, but I think it's important to know that the teachers, as represented by the PCPA officers, to know the commitment that's required of them and they know it beforehand, and they are confident that uh, this will be to the betterment of children's education. And the administration, through its research, which I've looked at, also feels that way. So I say uh, we need to study, we need to try this out. And as Jen says, everyone's accountable, absolutely everyone. So, and that includes the board, administration, and the community. So, I say it was a tremendous amount of work. It's been a long time, and I think it's taken all the work that this is a lot of work. I had a question unrelated to the early system of which I'm sure you will. Um, and then I have some comments. But as I was comparing the 2019 20 schedule, Last year's bid, you will notice that the 1819 year, the calendar assumes in the layout that we have used four emergency days and then get to the start the uh, school in the state. And then the 1920 calendar coming up it assumes a school ending date that we use no school days. Is there a reason for the change in those functions? It's probably the only number one percent. We have to add those five emergency days. We, we, have so many. we automatically have to do that. Okay. Um, and then I just have some general comments. So, uh, first of all, I want to start by thanking you for your presentation as well as taking the time to answer the questions that I had. I thought this has been really helpful in understanding this issue better. I also want to thank the Leverage and Time Committee for all the work they put into this uh, and eliciting feedback, answering questions, and the like. But I also want to thank the parents and, and the students who showed up tonight and expressed their concerns. I really do. Um, I support the early dismissal program, the broad, uh, the broad support of <coughs> teachers, administrators, parents, uh, read studies on the topic, and I'm going to read some of those. And I've had conversations with teachers in the late six months this year, and everyone seems to be in favor of it, including the parents that are concerned about the child care issues. It seems like this has broad based support, so I, I want to support it. Um, however, I do have some concerns, so those are my concerns to those that have been expressed by Mr. Trump today. Um, first, I'm concerned about the uh, overall reduction of five times. Um, been estimated, as Mr. Um, Armbrust mentioned earlier, that it, it, it reduces class time by 22 hours. Uh, it, that's the equivalent of about two fewer class time days in a school year. I take that very seriously. Um, second, I've heard from numerous parents. Uh, we heard from some tonight especially parents that don't currently use after school daycare because they'll be burdened by this policy. Uh, they've done their homework for themselves, and I just did, you know, some back of the you know, calculations, and the most cost-effective dropping child care option that I can find, $17 a day, which of course is like a school year, that's $665 per child for the school year. That's pretty costly. I mean, that's, uh, 
I take that very seriously. So, um, and third, I want to make sure that this change in policy has a significant impact, and that's to improve the quality of education for our students. And so, this new approach should be closely monitored. I'm glad that Farnsworth said that it will be. I'm encouraged by that, but I hope it's not just an annual thing. I hope we continually take that process over the school year and we're able to get information on the um, So, all that being said, I will vote in favor of, of the uh, 1920 school calendar. However, I, I want to examine over the next school year possibly modifying the remaining four sit days uh, in the calendar in order to reduce the amount of class time for students and use class time more effectively. I also believe that the district, kind of like Mr. Barry said, that to do what it can to assist families for which this new policy creates hardship uh, by helping you find more cost effective child care options. Uh, I think what Ms. Holman has said that you know, they have looked into partnering parents with uh, teenagers in the district that may be looking for extra money, for extra jobs. I think that's uh, if anything that we can do to help that happen, I think that's a good uh, option. We need to be creative, like we said before. But I really, I want you to know the bottom line is that I've heard your concerns. I didn't take them seriously, and I did not take, you know, this decision lightly. And third, over the upcoming school year, I'll be seeking information on the degree which the policy is successful, not just in that annual review. And uh, I'll be open to making modifications for the 2021 school year. So, one of the next I appreciate everybody coming out. In the email. Um, I know it's a huge impact on everybody. Um, I have a student in the, in, the, in the schools as well. It impacts everybody. Um, I just have a few questions. Um, I understand the hours are going to be taken away overall, but individually, how much time is going to be cut off in this class? So that will be at the building level. They're looking at that because they want to make sure that if they have one content area that is cut. We already run a similar schedule at the high school now with the late start Mondays, and each period is shortened by seven minutes. I believe. Seven minutes. Um, Elizabeth, Trisha, can you share maybe what you've looked for for the calendars in your buildings? I, I appreciate that question. Obviously, each of our buildings is different um, because our schedules are different. But just as an example, at GIS, um, where your student is, we have. Um, a 30 minute period, which is um, called Genius Hour, although um, it's an amazing um, leadership opportunity and a time for students to step away from uh, the general classrooms but utilize their skills. That's one of the areas that we believe that we could, um, on Wednesdays, um, um, cut for that day. They would have four days of Genius Hour every single week, though, and then they would only have to have. Um, approximately one to two minutes off of other curricular areas and then a little bit off of their um, introductory homeroom classes. So we're very fortunate at GIS that we will miss very little actual math, science, social studies, um, and reading curricular instructional time. I think at the elementary <coughs> buildings we started those discussions as well with our teachers. And we are looking at, we have a community building time where we utilize each day to build a sense of community and family within our classrooms. That will certainly be something that we will, on Wednesdays, reduce, um, possibly cut that. And then we're looking at cutting very little our ELA and math time and, and finding other places within the day to, to cut as well. We did make a commitment to protect, we have some concerns about our band, our fine arts, and our specials. And we really heard that, that came through from some of the feedback we received. And Um, another issue is the collaboration within the school. Is the collaboration within the school or are you going to collaborate with like uh, all elementary, general elementary? elementary? Are, they, are they going to try to collaborate and, or is it going to be focused on the school? The answer is yes. It's going to be a little bit of both. So, because there are definite times when we have to have conversations that are specific to the students, specific when we're looking at that data, but there are conversations that have to occur when we pull all fourth grade teachers of the implementation of our new ELA program. So we want to make sure that when we provide that our instructor coaches are looking at them, they get one message at one time and they want to My only concern with that is the travel time school is going to reduce that one hour. I know. We, we wish we could have all six on the same schedule. <laughs> 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 Daycares and the 
parents have called and done their research in their homework as well. Um, has, did somebody from our district call and verify that these after school programs would be willing to accept new, new kids in their programs by one day, or is it just the kids that are already in the after school program? Bessie they had all the conversations. Yeah, the they, they all agreed that they could service the current students, that they could not accept additional ones except for CRC at $17.50 an hour, which is just right across the street here, and the YMCA Africa could accept drop-ins for just one day, one hour. They confirmed that they could do that. And, the mic, and they said the one-day daily rate. I know you had said that you thought it was for two days. They told us, they told us one, it was one day. One day. They had to call us back on the website for two days. They, they, told, they confirmed one day for us. So, I, you know, again. Same price, double duty. It, 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 35. Well, it, it's 35 if you're a non-member and $30 if you're a member. It's $17.50 for that one hour at CRC. And our YMCA is covered each of our three elementary. Right. The graders are bus to over to the whole program. Right. That we, need to we really did look at the high school option, though, as we talked it out, and then we talked about it for what seemed like a very long time. Do you offer, you know, children who are under the age of 18 names and phone numbers, contact information to other parents? That brought other issues. We didn't want to just have minors' contact information out there. So. I mean, we're still open to how can we make a fit? Because I know a lot of high school kids who, who watch children after school. And with them being off at the same time on Wednesdays, they could use, you know, they, they're looking for for that fit to watch kids after school. But again, you know, to be able to pr provide, like we do a tutor bank, a, a, a you know, babysitting bank, we, we just felt like we couldn't put that risk out there. So the parents are going to have to reach out. Yeah. Care.com is an, a, another source. I know that people have talked about using. There were some counseling. high school that could be on care.com as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it, it gives us some time. I know the summer probably isn't a lot of time, but it does afford us a little bit of time to try to find out, you know, what more we can maybe do to reach high school students and match with our families. And then the collaboration between the teachers, is there going to be a specific agenda, or is it going to be weekly, or is it going to be set for the teachers? <laughs> So it's very much going to be guided and prescribed. Um, if there are specific things that can fit into that time and there are specific things that cannot, because that time is going to be protected. So we'll very much be looking for at student data, talking about instructional practices, backwards plan, creation of common assessments. Oh, there are a lot of conversations that will occur and it will be very much guided and prescribed because there's an accountability piece to it. Okay. I only have a couple more. Um, I know that this, the administration and the, and the teachers all want this. Um, at least that's what I've been told and what I've, and what I've heard. Um, are the teachers going to be mandated to be involved in this, or are they going to be able to opt out? No. When, when um, Mr. Kern talked about the contractual hours, this is part of their contractual time. And actually, we, we are committed to language so that we were on the same page so that everybody understands how this time is going to be because it is going to be guided and prescribed and protected because just just like the, the concerns that you have with the reducing of the instructional time, we have to make sure that that time we're getting the impact that we want to see. I appreciate the, the presentation that was well informed. I'm sure that there, it looks like a lot of people did a lot of homework on this and it is a huge impact on the entire district, <coughs> a huge impact for the board to approve this calendar. So with that being said, what are we going to do with the If the data is there, it says that really... I think you have lots of conversations about what can, what can we do next. We face that every day because every child that we meet has different needs. Mm -hmm. So that that is what we do. It is constant reflection and response. <coughs> so there will be conversations and it's we are not seeing the results that we had intended in the moment. And I appreciate the special needs being involved with us having that be the special needs and I know that's very tiresome and will be overwhelming at times. <coughs>
I am concerned about that. I've seen Chad rally behind lesser issues, so I think there's a lot of opportunity out there for our community groups, churches, things like that, to try to find some options to help our parents and their members come up with ideas here. Um, but it's, I've heard it for longer than three years um, from people, so it's definitely something I see the benefit in. Um, kudos to you guys. But what sucks about this job is somebody is always mad. So, um, in my crash course for the last few days, getting information, especially since I missed last meeting, you guys really have done one of the best jobs at making the least negative impact possible, I think, to the community. So, okay. anyone else have any comments? Anyone else? Um, I'd just like to say, and, and again, and Barry, please cut me off and correct me if I'm wrong here, but in terms of decisions in the school district our size, no decision that ever gets made, everyone is going to be behind or it's just an impossibility. And then we have to look at issues. There are many contributing factors, many potential outcomes, but the one singular thing that we have to keep in mind is, is this best for the education of the child? In this case, I believe we have both groups of our experts, the teachers and our administration, telling us that this is in the best interest for the education of our children. And I appreciate that collaborative work you all have done together to get us to this point tonight. With uh, no further comment, I need a uh, motion on 7.2 or um, another form of action. Yes, and just for clarification, your motion is to pass. Correct. Adapt that to attach the motion to the motion. Was there a second? Yes.
school year, uh, we would have had a deficit of 3250152 At the end of 18, due to people going and paying taxes early when they thought the federal government was going to do away with that, that tax deduction, itemized tax deduction, they were paying the taxes they ordinarily would have paid in May and June and July and August through November. They paid those in November and December. What happened then was the early tax payments for the head fund alone was over 1.5 million. The good thing is it reduced our dependency on early taxes. I mean, we went from collecting over oh, 10.7 million in 2017 to 2. Point, almost 2.3 million in 2018. So that um, that balance then of the deficit we would have ran had we not had early taxes would have been it dropped 600, a little over 650,000. <laughs> So that's the good thing. And the reason I'm focused on, on the education fund is that's where you're going to see the, the biggest impact here because O&M and transportation, they're moving into the black now. So I, I don't worry so much about that. If you go to the next graphic, I wanted to show how those early taxes then affected my FY19 budget. Because once again, when you're setting this budget, and just to, just to go off track for just a minute for those new board members, we start the budget process in March. And that's when teachers are getting together with department heads and saying, what are our needs? Um, in April, then, those department heads are meeting with principals. So the departments have set their priorities. They meet with the principals in April. The principal then has to set, what are my priorities for the building? Um, they develop those budgets. Those are given to me in May. At CSBO, I look at those budgets. And it's like, OK, well, what? how am I going to prioritize across all the schools? Because there's there's competition there for the same dollars. And how are we going to set those priorities? And I work with Dr. Wood um, in order to, to gauge, you know, where where we want our emphasis to be this year. Um, all of that takes place before we know what enrollment is going to be. Do we need to add new classes for a particular school because of higher enrollments? Um, are, are we going to have teachers leaving and other teachers coming on uh, who with different skill sets, different salary levels, different benefit levels? Um, so. When I'm actually setting this budget to be uploaded by August 1, the beginning of school, there's just so many unknowns. Uh, so that's what makes this process so important. We're always going to have to amend this budget because there's too much guessing involved during the year to make it work. Um, the reductions to my budget, and although I reduced the Ed Fund by half a million dollars, the impact was greater. It was almost the $1.5 million. And I was hoping that, that that wouldn't be the impact because some of those dollars that were being paid, I kind of assumed, okay, maybe those people would have paid them in May and June anyway. So to me, it won't be the $1.5 uh, But the reductions actually for the Ed Fund was 960000 less in tax revenues, I project, than what I had budgeted. And once again, I, there's a little bit of guesswork in here, because I'm basing that on what am I going to get in May and June that's going to impact this year's revenues. Well, you're guessing again, because I don't know when people are going to pay their taxes. Historically, it's 52% for us, but across the state, it's 48%. I'm hoping that the year, the gentleman last year decided to be in May and June again. Um, but that's an unknown. And the, the other funds then was less of an impact, uh, but the full impact for all funds was over $1.5 million. So how do we address the shortfall in the end fund of $960,000? Um, I, I want to say I have a lot of cooperation uh, with department heads and principals who really sharpen sure our principals and yeah, how, can we, how can we make this work. And so at the top is, or if you go to the next graph, actually, at the top is the original budget um, that I had created. At the bottom is the amended budget that I am presenting as information uh, to the board tonight only. You will set the public hearing date at tonight's meeting um, for that public hearing to be set at the next board meeting, which will be June 27th. That leaves the community 30 days in order to come in and do that amended budget if they so wish. So the Ed Fund, you'll notice, is, is going to run a deficit of 336361 But that's not really truly a deficit, because I collected those monies. We're cash basis taxpayer. I just collected them last year in November and December, so it fell in FY18 revenues, which made us look so much better in our historical need on those early tax dollars. It's why it dropped 653000 And I'm really happy with that $336,000 deficit, because it could have been so much higher 
because as you recall from the previous slide, we were 960 short in revenues. And a lot of this can be directly attributable to a 54% increase in one of our special ed providers. And they didn't notify us of this increase until January, and they made it retroactive to August 1st. So that budgeted line item went from 900,000 to $1.2 million. And there was no way any of us knew that that was coming. So that was definitely a block blind side. When you look at the O&M fund, I thought it was really important for uh, us to segregate out the excess bond proceeds. They're in the O&M fund now, uh, but what would the O&M fund look like if you removed those dollars? And so we had, um, we've got estimated expenditures of 2.8 million. I don't think Mike is gonna spend that. It's just what's in the budget. And um, the timing of when certain bills comes in is always up in the air. It doesn't hurt to throw it in there. Um, that way, if a miracle occurs, you get it all done this year, we're, we're good. Um, because I can't spend money in a budget that I haven't put before ISB. I can spend less money. I can't spend more money. And there's an error on this graph because the increase or decrease in that fund balance actually should, an O&M should be a negative $147,000 and some odd dollars. Um, the next fund is the debt service fund. And if you remember, I was going to come back to this because uh, the county sets the levies on these. So when you see the negative 199, 540, the money sitting there is just in the fund balance. We've collected those monies to make those payments last year. Um, a lot of the other funds look really good. Um, I want to I want to point out that we have stopped levying for life, health, and, and safety. And one of the reasons we've done that is because in order to spend that money, uh, is we have to approve it, or we have to approve it. And when we had to redo the front of Chatham Elementary School. <coughs> For security reasons, um, that project got denied for us to use Fund 90 money for um, because it changed the, the square footage of the entrance. And that knocked out, even though the primary purpose of that construction was totally security. So why levy in 90 when I can throw that money and levy it in O&M and we don't have to jump through those hoops? Um, so that's when you see the $139,000 deficit there. Our intention is to spend down those monies as those projects that the ROE and state board deems a fit that we can spend out of that fund. Um, so that is the amended budget. Um, and I would ask that you set the public hearing then for that for that uh, next board meeting. Everybody get that? <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, questions, comments, or concerns from the board? From one account to another, that was a super, uh, very deep, it was a super uh, discussion because there's so much going on there, but a very good job. I mean, the second section is that Chad was really good at the numbers and understanding the levy process, which is really important. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, that was the information. Do we need to actually we need to not set the date? You do need to set the date tonight for that public hearing. Yeah. But I mean, do, do we have that embedded in the meeting dates, or do we need to take action on that right now? I think we need a motion, don't we, Charlie? Yes. Well, just to be safe, let's make a motion to set the public hearing. Could I have a motion to set the public hearing date for the next board meeting, which is June twenty seventh? Second. Yes, Brian? Yes. Mary? Yes. Maddox? Yes. 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 Okay, 7.4, paper bid result. The paper bid is a routine bid that we go out for every single year. Uh, this year we had three bidders that bid on it. Um, Liberty was actually the lowest bidder by $112 for the year. Um, they are a company that's located in Los Angeles, California. Contract paper group is in Ohio. They were $112 more for the year. Our recommendation is to go with contract paper group for the primary reason um, $112 is, is not anything when you're spending $40,000 on paper in a year's time. And um, this company got the bid last year and their product is superb. Uh, the company we had before, because of the humidity that occurs where we store our paper during summer months, uh, we were having paper jams across the district. 
and, and I don't know, probably 50% of our, our copiers were experiencing these paper jams. To my knowledge, we've not had any of that wood contract paper, so I'm not inclined to want to gamble with another company when I know that this company really produces a good product and the difference in those bids are only $112. So it's my recommendation that the board approve contract paper group. Scott, I have a quick question. Part of my process of getting up to speed, I was looking at some of the school board statutes, and I don't know if this one applies, but it's uh, section 5 slash 10 dash 20 dot 19 C of the school code, and it, uh, it refers to recycled paper and paper products. Is, are we in compliance with that? Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll make that motion. Second. Yes. 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 Comparing all the bids together, it's probably going to save about fifteen thousand dollars a year to stay with Little Italy, which is in the contract with them. So it's not recommended for Little Italy to get. One quick question. Yes, sir. Yes. When you're evaluating those bids, is it other other factors that they can look at other than size? Well, they have to make sure they're meeting the nutritional requirements that are set by the National School Lunch Program. So we have to look at that um, in addition to that service that they provide us. You know, we're, we're working with a local business. Um, Fred Gorilla has been fantastic at the school. He's worked, us, worked with us on last minute changes and those like, snow days when we need to move a day. I mean, to work with a local business like that, that's something we can't put a price on. So they've provided us fantastic service the last few years. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay. Yes. 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 Seven six approval for joining the South County Area Purchasing Block. So currently, um, so this is my second year here. The last year and this year, we contracted with Cisco uh, for our food service. So rather than go out to bid this year, we began researching some purchasing co-ops that are designed to save us money. Because a large purchasing group. Um, so my recommendation based on the research we've done, rather than go up to bid again, to go with the uh, South County Co-op Purchasing Group. Estimated anywhere from about $20,000 on up that we could spend <coughs> per year over Cisco. I think that's a conservative estimate um, based on the research I've done. Yes, um, besides you, has anybody else looked at this um, <laughs> agreement and said that all of the returns are in I don't know. No, this hasn't been set to our attorney, not this particular contract. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you would <coughs> I've never done that in the past. Oh, Charlotte, you have a lot of experience. Yeah, I looked at the intergovernmental agreement. It, it looks good. It looks good. Okay, it looks good. Okay, because you have a lot of experience. Perfect. <coughs> Thank you. So, this co op agreement is we have obtained pur a purchasing power by being a member of the co op. And right, so, so right now we are one district going with Cisco, and we're, a, we're a, a drop in the bucket for them. Um, Compared to, if we go with the purchasing co-op, we become part of, oh, I think there's, there's 55, 57 districts that are in now, so we're a larger group being able to purchase, and whether this is a benefit or not, we will be the largest district within that purchasing co-op, which um, may give us a little more leveraging power or negotiating power to, to get some things done or already I met with some of the coal reps today, which is who, who does the uh, South County Co op. And there's some other benefits that I think are going to come out of this that we're not getting from going through Cisco now. Any questions? Yes. 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 Yes.
further comments from the board or questions? <coughs> Hearing none, I need a motion. Second. <coughs> I have a motion. Seven seven board meeting dates for nineteen twenty school. Any uh, points of discussion or comment from the board on the side? Move to approve the meeting dates. Yes. 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 All right, 7-8, first reading press policy, February, March 2019. This is information only, correct? Yes. I am um, with this one uh, option that I Good evening. Uh, we uh, went out to bid for band uniforms, uh, and one purchaser uh, or one company did come through uh, with a bid. Our original estimate was seventy-five to ninety thousand, uh, and the bid came in a little under seventy-five thousand. Uh, I did bring a sample for you to see uh, what they would look like. And Ms. Kudrod came if you wanted to ask her any questions as well. Um, so need approval to purchase so that we can get these sized and ready for uh, the fall football team. This is what you're not wearing. <laughs> 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 volunteer who has been seeming 
and reseaming all of the vents so the bottoms are completely torn up. Um, these, like I described in the March board meeting, uh, are much like little kids' pants where they button so you can adjust those lines without reselling, uh, and that's going to have a huge effect on the length of the. Okay. Any further discussion on this side? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I
are a very important part of students' work. Uh, from textbooks to folders, these containers do very much in making the walk from class to class as efficient as possible. <coughs> I am Isaac Dahl, and on behalf of the student body, I am advocating for backpacks. I will not only address the concerns of the board, but also provide evidence as to why backpacks should be allowed in Glenwood High School for not only next school year, but the years that follow. A backpack is just as necessary of a tool in school life as a pencil or a notebook. Uh, I am a sophomore at Glenwood High School and have been using a backpack for almost two school years now. Um, on the first day of freshman year, I was unaware that we were allowed to carry backpacks because they weren't allowed in middle school. However, when I started to carry my things to my first class, it was all just so heavy and so much that I couldn't do it. I thought to myself, I don't care if I get in trouble, I can't carry this all in my office. Imagine the relief I felt when I saw that uh, everyone else uh, was using their backpacks too. Now, when the Chromebooks were added to our materials, it was thought that the physical textbooks would be put onto the Chromebooks in some form whether we would be directed to websites that had the textbooks on them, or image files of the pages of the textbooks would be on the Chromebooks physically, on the actual space. In any case, uh, the physical textbooks would no longer be part of our look. In a way, this would also reduce the need for backpacks or even remove it entirely. Textbooks take up most of the space in a typical backpack anyway, so much so that another name for backpack is book bag. Uh, but even with the advent of Chromebooks, students still had to take the textbooks. Now, I understand that the board is concerned with safety, with it. Uh, but taking backpacks away will not solve the issue. If the issue is that one could use their backpack as a means of transporting a weapon or something like that, 
then would would metal detectors not solve this issue? There's no need for something as elaborate as airport security or even something as complex as the Illinois State Capitol building has. But if the library can have a little machine to detect if books that haven't been checked out are leaving, then why can't metal detectors of the same style be put to doors? But now, in conclusion, tonight, I set out with the goal of keeping backpacks allowed in school. I address the concerns of the students as well as the con of concern of the school. <laughs> Ideally, backpacks will stay in school. However, I'm willing to compromise. I mentioned making textbooks available on the Chromebooks, uh, removing the need for a container to carry the physical copies. Uh, and there's also the option of metal detectors, which would be used to bind the weapons that before they got too far into the school to be used. And while opaque backpacks may be an issue, transparent backpacks also solve both of our problems. Anyone can see inside the backpacks without searching them, and students are still able to carry material from class to class. These are the better solutions to the problem, I assure you. And on behalf of the entire student body, I implore you to utilize one of them. However, if you need more substantial evidence before making your final ruling, then I invite you to come to Glenwood High School. Take six Chromebooks, two notebooks, a trapper keeper filled with papers, uh, and uh, run a schedule. See for yourself if it is easier with or without a backpack. For it's easier to make a decision when the negative consequences of said decision don't affect you. I'm Isaac Dahl, representing the student body. Thank you. Hey, Isaac, I'd like to make a comment just to let you know. We, the board received a letter
one little bow down there? Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's already it's already um, passed. And one of the things that I think is really important to know is that Randy Allen is our the director of um, um, safety and security. And Randy is very well respected vocally. I mean districts call upon him for advice and the excitement. Students like myself, or students 
that have other issues to be able to carry them as needed. However, what I'm suggesting is that, as written, this policy becomes a burden on all students. I am here this evening to plead with the board to either reconsider their decision to implement this policy or at least consider how much this would complicate daily life for students on a lonely campus. Minimally, I am asking for the student board to consider a compromise on the extent of the policy to assist with the transition of a smooth way of doing things. Since the policy is designed to address perceived negatives in our current book bag policy, I would like to take a moment to discuss how having book bags during the day has positively affected me and and then I'll let Anushka explain to um, other students who have also addressed their concerns. <coughs> I will start with my own story and how book bags have made my life easier. For example, between fourth period and fifth period, I go from then to Honors English, which is on opposite side of the school. The class is in the new way, which increased the size of our school just a few years ago. I make it to English on time with no problem because I don't have to stop by my locker. As an experiment, I time myself to see how long it takes. At a walking place, if I were to go to my locker before going to class, it took four minutes and 19 seconds just to stand by my locker and then immediately walk onto the classroom. If you add a few extra minutes on top of that to open the locker and grab everything I would need, I would be late to that class. I was also a transfer student into the Glenwood school system, starting into my freshman year. I came from a small private Catholic school. The level of stress and intimidation of being new for school, while not being familiar with the layout and at the same time being on this classroom, was a struggle on its own there. The reason why I left home was enough is because it was so easy for me to transition. But I believe that if I would have been forced to try to carry either all of my books in my arms or stop by my locker to near the class, I didn't believe I would have been able to make it on time for most of my classes that first year. Compounding the normal structure of high school with the addition of this, compounding the normal structure of high school with the addition of our disciplinary action. And I would like to make sure to continue with my conversation. Right, my name is Amish Kanama. I'm a junior at Middle High School. First, to provide a physical display. Um, this right here isn't even all the contents of my, contents of my backpack. This is just what I would have to carry to one class, excluding my Chromebook, which I do not bring today. Um, this is a second planner because you should expect to stay on top of your assignments. Pencil case because you are required to have your own supplies in writing pencils. Calculators because in math and science classes, the teachers don't have enough calculators that function properly to provide for every single student in the class. Typically in English, which four years are required to graduate, you have a book that you're reading, so I pretty much always have a book on me. I also have um, a lab notebook. That is required by all classes, but it just shows that different classes require different special notebooks and binders, so that's another thing I would have to carry. Here I have a normal spiral notebook that I have to bring to my classes note um, because most classes operate on a lecture based curriculum. Here I have a textbook and like Isaac said, um, the edition of Chromebooks was supposed to also reduce the need for physical textbooks. However, in many of my classes, they tried online textbooks that we wouldn't need physical copies. However, the online textbooks did not work. And then this is just a folder which you get very, a lot of handouts because online handouts are not as common as they said they would be this year, so you also have to have a folder to hold all of your things. And then if I can get some other things. That's, that's a, a real quick question. Yes. You, you said all of those items for a, are for a singular class? So that, um, in, <laughs> um, in exception to this, this is an example of what I would have to bring to my entrepreneurship class. In exception to this um, textbook, which I'm not going to make you pull out, in this, that's what I would need for AP Biology. And it just goes on. This is just a standard load that I would have to carry for each of my classes, not to be a Chromebook, which is also expected um, that students bring all of their classes. All right, and then um, also I'd like to address, I carry a water bottle all the time. There are a lot of student athletes, and on game days, you're required, and by your coaches, um, and it's highly recommended that you drink water throughout the day, so you are dehydrated for the game. Um, my water bottle is pretty heavy. There are other options, but that's just another, <laughs> <laughs> that's just another thing that you have to carry around, um, which one would be two stories for all but one wing, so two hallways. That makes walking up and down the stairs a potential hazard because 
I know I personally would fall if I didn't have my bag to help me carry all of those things. Um, also, one concern is that backpack and holding all of that on your back, that is um, detrimental for physical health of teens as well as children. However, um, Dr. Uh, Patel, who is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and other medical professionals, agree that um, more crouching and pain, like in your back, from losing your back posture is more so from technology, which is increasing in the world, um, rather than cause of backpacks. Um, as far as the notice that went out to the students and parents in the district, and it claimed that this was this um, policy was put in place because of um, hazards such as safety regarding weapons um, and violence. I'll get into that later, but it was also put in place um, as regards to the hazards. There hasn't been much research on this, um, but personally, I believe that it might be more hazardous for teachers and students walking through the aisles of the classroom to have all those items spewed on the floor if they get kicked over. That, to me, presents um, a larger hazard than having a backpack on the floor, which can also be tucked under. Um, a counterpoint for that is that most of the desks at Southern High School have the wire basket underneath. However, those are rarely big enough. They could not fit that load I showed you earlier. They are not wide enough to fit the Chromebooks um, when they're in the case and to be required to keep our Chromebooks in the case. So in that would have to be made in order for us to use the wire um, basket. And also most textbooks don't fit that they are too wide. I would also like to point out that many wire baskets are missing wires and some of them are even on the chairs. Um, then in reference the other safety concern, which is that students can be struggling in a confidence into the school. Um, I'd like to, I understand that safety, like the best interest of this policy is to promote safety for students and for teachers and everyone in these schools. Um, I'd like to just talk about three mass school shootings real quick um, to address how those went down. So the Parkland shooting in Florida, that um, Nicholas Cruz was the um, shooter. He was expelled from the school because he wasn't a student, and he brought his weapon in through a rifle bag, which is a black duffel, not the size of a backpack, not able to be classified as a backpack, and he also was able to enter the building through an unlocked entrance um, in a stairwell. The same was elementary shooting. That was an adult shooter um, who was 20 years old out of Atlanta. He was able to get in because they didn't have monitored doors, which is what Southern High School has, which also have a lock system where the security staff has to let you in in order to enter the front door. And then even in Columbine, Eric Harris was a student who um, was the person who took out the mass shooting, and he didn't even have his weapon. Um, this was when schools weren't as hard as the safety policy. He didn't even have his weapon on him during the school day. They had an open access system, and he was allowed to go out to his car, access his bucket bag with his weapon in it, and then proceed to carry out the shooting that he was in. So that's just to say that in these major instances of shooting, it wasn't a student most of the time, and they didn't carry it in a backpack. But that isn't to say that students are not able to bring weapons in their backpack. Um, and also, in reference to Columbine, how uh, Eric Harris was allowed to go out to his car and then access that duffel bag. Already, the students have access to cars um, during the school day. They have to get permission from the security staff, so the security kiosk in the front, and a potential um, compromise to that to ensure that they aren't having any contraband from their car. Is that the security staff um, escort them to their car to ensure that they aren't trying to be disabled or after contraband? Um, as far as it goes with um, the scheduling is was talking about on how you could potentially be party, um, party or serious policy at the school um, and they go on your record if you need detention. Um, policy 7-130, um, section D number five, says that the student responsibility is to be punctual and present to the best of one's ability. This ability is not able to be fully achieved if students are having to go through their locker between every class, so that can be more more detention and more disciplinary action. Also, that's the contraband. Um, so the banning of backpacks is a preventative measure against violence. However, um, 
a study done at the University of Toledo and also at the University of Toledo. I know um, Mr. Brewer is the president, and he will really be nice to tell him that. But um, it's about the board requests about that you would make your comments in five minutes. And um, in lieu of um, perhaps there are other um, participants who would like to talk, can you just can you summarize? Um, I think I I know the historical perspective that you're reviewing because I've also reviewed it, but um, if if your your sort of that's the conclusion of your recommendation, perhaps then someone else can speak. Um, may I just add one last comment about the recommendation? Yeah, sure. Um, so the review was done in the University of Washington. It reviewed um, in the past 18 years, mass shootings in school and gun violence, and they found that preventative measures such as monitoring security doors um, and like all that all management in time, they do not cause a decrease in the rate of mass shootings with 2018 being the highest incident rate of school shootings in school and gun violence. So that is just to say that there is no proof that the preventative acts could work against the violence. Okay. Would uh, Samma get us a little more uh, organized just with respect? Would any more students like to address the board on anything? And then I'll move on to uh, parents and, and, yeah. uh, and others. I think they are. Um, okay. If you can make it over there, okay. great. If it's not, right here. there is fine. Okay. Well, state your name. Okay, well, I was just going to say in reference to contraband, um, I, at least in terms of this proposed idea to try to, yeah, keep contraband out of the school, I just don't think that it's a very good idea considering most of, I mean, the majority of the kids who bring contraband into the school, including like vapes and things like that, they keep it on them. They don't keep it in their bag. They can get it out of their locker easily still. So, like, you know, like they still have access to the contraband just because they don't have their backpacks. Doesn't mean you can't put it in your pocket, your jacket, like your bra. Like, yeah. Yeah, or go near lock it. Yeah, and get it. So you still have access to contraband if you wanted to bring it into the school. It'd just be in your locker and you can still get it. It's something that's a very good way to fight it. Like the metal detector idea, like you said, that could work, but. Yeah. Thank you. Any, any, any other students would wish to address the board? May I make one more comment before? Sure. I was going to see what's up tonight. Um, this is about the compromise because I can come here and talk about all these problems, but it's like there's something that needs to be done about it. Right. So um, I've always believed that pointing out problems about offering a task for the solution is not helpful. But to that end, I would like to discuss some ideas so we might meet in the middle but can be doing away with the policy altogether and full enforcement of the policy out of one suggestion that comes to mind is to allow the lengthening of the passing period of five to minutes to allow as to time necessary for students to be able to get to a locker. Another would be to follow the examples of other schools, like Springfield High School, that allow um, either clear bags or book bags or or smaller like purses that are not bigger than a notebook. So it's a way to um, make it smaller so it's easier to search if necessary, um, and it's less likely that people will be confident with that too. Um, the school. Um, and in conclusion, it's just there needs to be some type of like, compromise to be able to make the students able to get through this process on time, to be able to focus on school rather than the stress of having a book bag, not having a book bag, um, and having to worry about that, especially as a freshman, as someone who's new, that anyone who has been already been in school knows that it's going to be a struggle. I have middle schoolers sign and comment on it saying that, yeah, okay, they have it at the middle school, but it's not working, that kids are being late, that kids don't like this policy, and that it's not um, going well for them, and it's just them out as it is. Um, Thank you. Um, i just like to say, if you guys are not on the school of 18, <laughs> 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 Would uh, anyone like to address the school board on uh, any other items? Yes, sir. I'd like to address that. 
Sure, absolutely. I can just ask your name and no questions there. I work for the school district as a resource officer at the high school and I do coach school basketball. No. <coughs> I appreciate all the comments <coughs> by the students. I <laughs> I believe all of you received a little packet, I guess, from Mr. Allen, is that correct? Uh, not yet. Oh, not yet. Okay. He was not yet. I was responsible for most all of the research on this. Um, we had many committee meetings. Dr. Wood was in a couple. Uh, Christine Lane was in a couple. And Ms. Dusty was. Numerous people were involved. This is not something that was taken lightly. It was very serious. And it was all about student safety and securing things that could be accessed easily. Okay. <clears throat> the first thing I will show you, I'll give this to you. I've always been told that picture is worth a thousand. I'll share this with you. This was taken today by one of the high school teachers who <laughs> liked the security. <laughs> I'd like to show that to the board. The first picture is before class. The next two are during class. Shows the clutter book bag create. That becomes an issue in case of needing to get out of school in hurry. Okay. It also allows somebody to bring something right to a classroom that they need being necessary for some type of biomass. I agree <laughs> that. There's no guarantee that something can't be brought into school even without a book bag. Okay? There's never a guarantee. No matter what the school does, no matter what law enforcement does, <coughs> things are going to happen. Being proactive is better than being reactive. Why take the chance on having someone injured or have fatality as in these other schools? Granted, Columbine, that wasn't even thought of back then, but things like that happening. Okay? Yes. Do we want to be the first school to have that happen? I don't think so. I'm sure all of you students are going to be safe and feel secure. Okay? Board members, you see how funny that classroom is? How is it an issue? When they walk the hallways and have the backpack on, it creates more of a problem in the hallway. Okay? So, I know the comment was I have to go to my locker every hour. My question to those of you that are in high school now, how did you manage middle school? I didn't know. It was different. Well, okay. It was different. I understand that part. But did you have to plan better? Like supplies. It was small. We had like supplies back then. But did you have to plan? Not for, you no, sure? not not for, for a large of a school. Yeah. Not okay, let me give you something about the large school. Security walk one end to the other casually. Four minutes. From the far south end to the far north end. Four minutes. Yeah. We didn't do that. It allows another minute to do that. There are other people in the hall. Okay. Um, so, that's real, real quick, I'm going to rein this in here real quick. The the uh, address of the school board is for folks to address the board. Um, I get concerned with the crosstalk and the overtalk of points will get missed, unheard, or potentially points will get frustrated. So just kind of as a point of order here, I'm going to remind everyone, and I've been very loose tonight in terms of time limits and allowing everyone to be heard for the sake of these items. But I need the conversation to be at the board and not with each other. Thank you. Thank you. Please, 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 please. Anyhow, there are many statistics on both sides of the fence. Okay. The information that we're going to share with you has a summarization of all the research that I did together, talked about schools visited, talked about schools talked to, Bowling High School, three-story building, five-minute passive period, book bags in the locker, taking care of pencil case, trapper keeper. Now, trapper keepers, I don't know the limitations, to be honest. I know there's been discussion about having it, so it could be expanded up to two inches, things like that, but I really don't know the size they're allowed. Block Island High School had it the same way. Many schools have had this for 15 years. I tried to talk to schools and contact schools that are similar to Glenwood because I think that's important. Um, their concerns were clutter, 
ability to bring things in school, hit it. <coughs> and who knows if things aren't brought in anyway. But I'll make a couple of points that are about the book bags being in the line. Other issues that we have in school, theft. Students take their book bags to the locker room, lay them on the floor, things are stolen. Okay? That would reduce that to zero. There would be no more book bags. They don't have room to put those book bags in all the lockers in the PE room because they have so much in them. Understood. If they go to their lockers, plan their day out, will it be easy? No. It's new. There's been many things changing in Illinois for security matters. And at first, there's resistance and concern. And most always, it becomes okay. Because it's for their safety. <coughs> Security of the building, which provides space to everyone in the building. My understanding is that teachers are for having book bags in the locker. That teacher in particular said, it's a real problem with my class. Okay. I just think, I understand you said it was okay, and if you have some concern about it, I understood all that. I've seen this. The board has enough presence of mind to use it. As in other programs we mentioned today, there can be adjustments made to improve if necessary. Whether that be at time capacity period, whether that be an adjustment to what they can carry, all those things are open for discussion. But I think one year is a good proven though. So I would recommend that the school board as they recommend the cost. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to address the issue myself now. So I, I first applaud those of you who put together this petition. I mean, that's an impressive feat, getting 1,600 uh, signatures. Um, I certainly appreciate the input. I think that, uh, you know, last month was my first board meeting. This was a, a, an item that was part of a number of handbook changes. So I appreciate all of you who have come here tonight to bring this issue to the attention of the board. I appreciate you prompting the discussion. I don't think this issue deserves uh, received the uh, discussion it deserved last month. Um, I uh, one thing I want to point out. I don't, I don't think any of you all did this, but I, and Doug, feel free to jump in on this. But, um, my initial thought was that the, the book bag ban was put in place because of security issues, prevent weapons, other paraphernalia coming into the school. But it's, it's more than that. I mean, you mentioned the clutter, but uh, there, you told me the story about the, uh, the, the, the bomb threat and there was a real problem um, navigating through all the book bags and it took forever. To, I mean, a couple of items that we had. Number one, of course. I don't think you guys bring it out. Not always. You know, I look at school safety as um, layers and barriers. Well, we're never going to be able to say 100 percent certainty that anyone is going to be safe and we can't go in and we're going to stop someone from bringing in this. But it is another layer. It is another barrier to prevent something like that. Contraband and those types of things are certainly not an issue. Secondly, brought up, I know, uh, 15 years ago, 12, 15 years ago, there was a real push about backpacks in regards to the health uh, risks in terms of the spine, the shoulders, and the hips. Um, and as a result, many look bad as a result of that. The, the third piece is the corner of the hallway. I'm not sure that I know that Mr. Allen is also going to find some information. But we did have our fire chief, I believe our inspectors come in, and that was one of the first thing they found in was the clutter and the, and the aisles, the hallways, and how that was a safety barrier. And fourth, uh, one of the things we did, we had a, we had a, uh, a bomb scare somewhere to call it in. We evacuated the high school. Unfortunately, those students, uh, which I would have done the same, grabbed my book bag, and everybody went over to the elementary school as an alternative site. 
Well, now all of a sudden, there's concern there. And we actually did. We got some concerned parents who called us and said, you know, what could have been an emergency in the high school has now been transferred to the other school. So uh, the transfer of the backpacks was, again, another concern. Uh, not that it's going to where a locker was any different, but the fact that they were able to transfer a potential danger to the building. So that's what you're referring to. I know that's one of the concerns that the committee has. Well, so, and you had mentioned the committee. I look forward to receiving the information, but I also would, I don't, I don't again, I'm not sure what kind of committee this is, but I would like to meet with members of the committee to discuss potential accommodations or exceptions to this <coughs> backpack, backpack ban that may allow, uh, you know, make life a little easier for some of the, the students. I think uh, I think there are justifiable reasons that in support of, of the uh, of pre preventing students from bringing regular backpacks into class. But I want to talk about uh, ways in which we might be able to accommodate. There, there was. I don't know the exact word because I didn't see the final word. But there was discussion about special accommodations for certain situations. Right. I, I want to talk about um, potentially changing some of the, the words of the, the, the prohibition. Um, that's something I'd like to discuss with the committee. I'm going to be last and I'm going to be brief. Um, we began work on this in March of uh, last year. And I'll be the first to admit I'm not naive. I'm a retired state trooper. If somebody's going to do something to the school, they're going to do it. Um, as I've told Dr. Wood many times, what we're trying to do is slow that down. I can't prevent everything, but we can make it more difficult for, for something to happen and we can react quicker. Uh, backpacks is just another layer of defense. It's like a locked door or a buzzer or a police officer at the front door. Um, I know that the kids don't have. <coughs> A lot of the stuff in the backpacks is on the person. Um, we, we can't strip search kids in the school. Uh, metal detectors, while would be great, are inconvenient because they, they could go off constantly. We have to have personnel there to stop and inspect that student when the detector goes off. So the backpack thing for me was a, was a slam dunk. And I'll, I'll give you something quick, which I'm going to give to you guys in shortly. Um, uh, we did have our fire chief, I believe our inspectors come in, and that was one of the first things they found was the clutter and the aisles and the hallways and how that was a safe area. And fourth, uh, one of the things we did, we had a, 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 a bomb scare somewhere to call in. We evacuated the high school. Unfortunately, <coughs> those students which I would have done the same. I had my book bag, and everybody went over to the elementary school as an alternative site. Well, now all of a sudden, there's concern there, and we actually did. We got some concerned parents who called us and said, you know, what could have been an emergency in the high school has now been transferred to the other school. So uh, the transfer of the backpacks was, again, another concern. Uh, not that it's going to where a locker room was any different from the fact that they were able to transfer a potential danger to the building. So that's what you're referring to. I know that's one of the concerns that the committee has. Well, so, and you had mentioned the committee. I look forward to receiving the information, but I also would, I don't, I don't, again, I'm not sure what kind of committee this is, but I would like to meet with members of the committee to discuss potential accommodations or exceptions to this <coughs> backpack, backpack ban that may allow, uh, you know, make life a little easier for some of the, the students. I think uh, I think there are justifiable reasons that in support of, of the uh, of pre preventing students from bringing regular backpacks into class. But I want to talk about uh, ways in which we might be able to accommodate. There, there was. I don't know the exact word because I didn't see the final word. But there was discussion about special accommodations for certain situations. Right. I, I want to talk about um, potentially changing some of the, the words of the, the, the prohibition. Um, that's something I'd like to discuss with the committee. I'm going to be last, and I'm going to be brief. Um, 
began work on this in March of uh, last year. I, I'll be the first to admit I'm not naive. I'm a, I'm a retired state trooper. If somebody's going to do something to the school, they're going to do it. Um, as I've told Dr. Wood many times, what we're trying to do is slow that down. I can't prevent everything, but we can make it more difficult for, for something to happen and we can react quicker. Uh, backpacks is just another layer of defense. It's like a locked door or a buzzer or a police officer in front door. Um, I know that the kids don't have <coughs> a lot of the stuff in the backpacks is on their person. Um, we, we can't strip search kids in the school. So, uh, metal detectors, while well, be great, are inconvenient because they, they could go off constantly. We have to have personnel there to stop and inspect that student when the detector goes off. So. The backpack thing for me was a, was a slam dunk, and I'll, I'll give you something quick, which I'm going to give to you guys in a short time. Um, for Illinois schools with a banned backpacks, and this is just a few that we talked to. Carlinville, Piazza Southwestern, Morrisonville, Staunton, Shelbyville, Marion, Rock Island High and Junior, Moline High School for over a decade, Chillicothe High School 12 years ago, Pena High School two years ago, following the shooting in that too. All three District 186 schools, backpacks three years ago and the middle school in 2005 that's just surrounding schools here we also talked to now mckinley high school in Niles, ohio manatee county florida banned backpacks after receiving threats made to more than 12 other schools and park county school did come on the base um last month we had a student in urbana that had a backpack with 49 rounds of ammunition in it and refused to be searched they have to be arrested. He made a social media threat to shooting a student in another school. I'm listen. I'm with you. I, I had two daughters go to the high school. I I want to make it easy for you guys to get by. And as as you indicated, there will be exceptions made. But if it's in my power to stop something, I'm gonna, I'm going to do it. And this this is for me. This is a this is an option we should really strongly strongly consider. Uh, there are schools in a while. Clear backpacks. Uh, one of them in particular is Marion. The kids put on the clear backpack and put it in their locker. <coughs> Still can't have it out. Um, and finally, the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission reports that nearly 28,000 backpack related injuries were treated in 2010. So, my daughter had scoliosis. Um, I don't know if it contributed, but it was, it was difficult. That's my two cents. I'll give you guys this for, for you. Thank you. I, I, I see your hand. I, I will give you one more brief, brief, brief moment. All right. Just to address the board, as Mr. Barry suggested, having a board member on that committee um, to review this policy, it's my recommendation, as since this policy is already in place, to further make accommodations for students and exceptions to this policy. Just to review and see what the students think about it, it's my recommendation that students also be given the opportunity to be members, contributing members to that committee, and only to share their opinions. And in March of 18, when we started this, we had a student representative, senior, three. We had three students on the on the board with us on the policy committee. So. <clears throat> Mind if I add one thing? Yeah, um, I want to reiterate kind of what Randy said in the fact that it is a preventative maintenance. Uh, it is just one more layer of defense. And I come about this from a man that was a principal that had a school shooting on his campus. Um, and I take that very, very serious and the safety very, very serious. I don't wish that my experience on anybody in the world including the community and the school i was principal of was very very similar to glenwood high school so from my experience personal experience being a principal that experienced school shooting i want to continue to try to get more layers so that our kids are safe here in chat the uh, i just had a question about the uh, what do these kids do with their band equipment or their sports equipment when they bring in play ball or we, we talked to Dusty about that. Uh, with the sports equipment, we were going to make an accommodation for them uh, somewhere in athletics. 
for those that uh, don't drive, for those that drove, we suggested they keep their equipment in their vehicles. The band equipment would be the same. Just one, one last comment. You know what, you guys bring up some, some valuable insight. I really do. I know when I was going to school, I said, school, yeah, but you know, it wasn't even an option. I went to Laura Central Hall in high school in Los Angeles, 5,000 students, campus, five times the size of the one one side here. At the end of the day, we have an outstanding safety and security director and security. We truly do, and I think we can do that. They do the research, they do the background. And at the end of the day, I know the superintendent, every day that I wake up and every night that I go to bed, my greatest concern is student safety. It's not about curriculum, it's not about instruction, it's student safety. And it has been for 30 years. So I get it, I do, and I understand. I know that we'll probably have a discussion about different accommodations, which I think will part of the plan to begin with. I think you certainly got it in that. But I certainly don't want to walk away from this room without giving a clear, clear understanding of appreciation for the security team that we have in place and the research that they've done and the recommendations. You know, because at the end of the day, I have three daughters. There's nothing more valuable than those three daughters. And I will do anything it takes to help protect them, whether it's their physical being or whether it's their safety and their weapons or whether it's unblocking a walkway in a classroom. So I get it. And there are times when sometimes adults and directors, we, we formulate these ideas to make it uh, the best environment for the kids. So number one, I appreciate your input. Number two, I know that certain things like accommodations and things that we talked about are going to be considered. And finally, number three, uh, I just want to extend a sincere thank you and appreciation to our safety, uh, director of safety, Security team. We work very closely with our sheriff's department, Sangamon County, local police department, and so they also have some insight when these problems develop. So thank you very much. Would anyone like to address the board on any items other than that? I, I have just one question. Uh, it's going to be just quick. Really does in regard to this. 
I don't think there's anything more difficult at least I've found than to look at considering changes with the school mascots. Um, but it's done for all the right reasons. I think it's gone full circle and they're headed in the right direction. And I think there's going to be some closure right here this soon. So thank you very much. So I'll just say an hour. And, uh, yes, two seconds, Bill. All right. <clears throat> I have no skin in the game. Been through the plane. No skin in the game with the whole backpacks, the whole, all that stuff. But I do have three kids in the district. And what I have heard tonight is the kids' complaint about we have these Chromebooks and they had an intent and the intent is not being met. So I guess my question would be what are we doing to fix that intent? Because if the, really the intent was to uh, remove the need for books, to remove the need for additional folders, to remove the need for even notebooks, but yet now we're instead of doing away with those, it's in addition to. How can we fix that problem? And if we fix that problem, does it solve the problem and everybody's issues go away? That's all I had. So, you know, just keep for thought. What up? Well, yeah. so I was just going to say I'll apologize to everyone for the length of tonight's meeting. This was the first meeting of the new board, and I was purposely a little bit loose with the time allotment for folks because I wanted the first impression of the new board to be that we were going to uh, allow everyone to be heard. We will be typing those things up as uh, we proceed. Like everyone enjoys being here at 10 o'clock and we can uh, keep, it, keep it open for you. I've got one more thing. I will be hosting an uh, office hour on Wednesday, of May 30th. I'll be at, at the high school GHS from at 4.30 if anybody wants to come and chat about four issues. All right, I think I need a motion to move.